What's up, storytellers? On today's Impactful Writing Podcast, Caleb and I will be asking some questions that should be relevant to all writers. One, how should writers start a story and all of the different things that go along with that. We'll discuss what the impact of starting a new story looks like for the audience. We'll also look at specific techniques writers use to engage audiences right from the start. And we'll also discuss the emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical journey related to the storyteller as they begin their new stories. That actually is um, is prompted by a lot of Caleb, what Caleb has been passionate about doing. So um, I thought we should we should incorporate that into our show every week because because Caleb's got a lot of good resources there. How are you this week, Caleb? Uh, I am good. I'm good. I am in. Uh, we're finally back in our apartment. Um, so here I am in my very own office. So that's nice. <laughs> that is nice. Yeah. It's nice to be. Although you said that your your living arrangement was fantastic. So that's it was fantastic. Too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's so. very cool. Very, very cool. Um, so uh, I'm Jay Shear, co-author of the full cast audio book, Death of a Bounty Hunter, which we have a release date for and will be coming in November. I'll give more specifics when I have uh, gotten that approved with my co-writer because I haven't run that by him yet. But we will be releasing it starting in November. So that will be really fun. Um, Caleb Munro is a comic book writer and the screenwriter of The Mongolian Connection, which you can go watch on Amazon, right? You can go rent it on Amazon? Amazon, Google Play. Um, it's supposed to be on iTunes, but I don't think it's actually appeared there yet. I don't know what, what's going on. Got it. The the so. o- the overreaching Apple. They're trying to, uh, to not look at it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what distributors are for, so I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, we were just talking about that before we started the show. Like, do you want to be a producer and worry about those things, or do you just want to be a writer and just worry about the storytelling? Um, that's what you have to face a lot of times in these things. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and jump into this. Um, this, this. How do you start a story? How should we start cool. stories? And one of the, the important aspects of this show, at least for me, I know Caleb um, feels this way as well, is that we don't just talk about what a lot of other writing podcasts would talk about, which is just only technique. Um, we want to be able to get into uh, some of the things that go beyond technique, into why the human race enjoys storytelling so much and why they want to engage in stories. So that means understanding why audiences are moved by stories. It's not just about what you do. It's also about why you should do it. So Caleb, what are some of the implications of beginning a new story for our audiences why do audiences care about engaging in new stories and what compels audiences to invest in those stories um you know this is going to go back to one of our earlier episodes where we talked about what is a story Mm. but uh but i would say that the reason audiences care about engaging in new stories um and what compels them to do so is that stories are enjoyable um they uh, uh they create pleasure, chemical pleasure in our brain to consume Mm. stories. Um, They uh, provide improvement. Stories make us better at living, which we also covered, Um, uh, better at empathy, better at at conflict solving. Mm. And stories offer a, offer meaning. Um, Each, each story is in a, we, we also said that behind each story, there's the question, which is what does it mean to be human or why live in the first place? Mm. And every story has a has presents a theory on that, and I think that we we collect those because we are looking for mm. more meaning in our lives. So I would say enjoyment, improvement, and meaning are the rain, main reasons people want are always looking for new stories to consume. Yeah, I, I have a very I have a lot of the similar notes because I, I actually I, I bring this book up all the time, but if you are a writer, I do encourage reading at least the first part of this book, which is all about um, how the human brain is wired for storytelling, um, wired for stories and how the human brain deals with stories. And even if you just read the first few chapters, you will begin to get a better understanding of of how that kind of works for the human brain, which is what your audience is. Your your audience is composed of a bunch of human brains. And so how can you tell tell a really compelling story? But I did a, a little extra research on this um, and, I, and I, I've i already clicked off of the website. Otherwise I would like to give them credit <laughs> for this, but um, they talked about the release of um, oxytocin, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, which is actually what allows us to empathize. And we empathize with the characters in the story and therefore we want to act like the characters in the story. 
just a lot of what you're already what you're already talking mm-hmm. about. And just like you brought up, we talked about this a few weeks back. Mm-hmm. I brought this up too a few weeks back. You described stories as the idea of solving problems. A, a story is presents us with a problem, and then you know we try to work that out. Um, we want, and I think that that looks like a piece of the world that's wrong that we want to figure out a solution for. And so because the world is not as it should be, and I think this would be a good, interesting philosophical topic to get into, right? Like, do you, do you feel like the world is as it should be, or do you feel like the world is not as it should be? And and are you trying to fix it? Now, I come from a pr- perspective that says the world is, is, is not at all what it should be. And therefore, this is why stories are so relevant, because the world is so full of problems that we all want to solve those problems. And we want to engage in stories because it helps us think through how we might do that. Um, so I think that engaging in storytelling actually allows us to fight back against the, the imperfect way that the world operates. Um, and I do think that because there are so many stories out there, I do think that we need to, as writers, focus on the stories that really mean something. So you just talked about that, like having stories that mean something. Um, I think that that is never more important than it is now because there are far fewer gatekeepers than there were. It used to be that if you wanted a story published, you were almost certainly going to go to a publisher who had a printing press or who had whatever, and they were going to decide whether your story was worthy or not. Nowadays, you don't have those gatekeepers. You can go release any story you want to yourself. Um, You just talked about, before we started the show, you were just talking about maybe doing some Kickstarters later in the year. Mm -hmm. We publish a lot of, I publish a lot of my stories through the Reclamation Society, which is also run by me. So I have to figure out how how to release those things. So if you're going to tell a story, you know, figure out a way for that story to be really meaningful in some way, just like you talked about. It should have this, it should have uh, uh, something that is deeply personal to you that you are wrestling with in a way to solve a problem for the world around you. Um, Because people want to resolve conflict. We don't want to exist in conflict. We want to overcome conflict. And I think that that would be uh, really positive. So I think that's one of the reasons too, is like, like we're hungry for, for this release of going my daily life. One of the most popular films out there was, uh, what was it? Um, Contagion during the pandemic, right? Like (laughs) one of the most popular, why? Because there's a problem in the world. What is it? It's a pandemic. Okay, well, what do we do about this? And we go to stories to help us figure out like what might this look like and how might this get worse? How might it get better? What should, how should I act differently based on these things? So stories are like ingrained in us. Um, to be able to behave differently, to seek wisdom, to seek a, a way of doing things differently, a way to s- seek catharsis, a way to seek a chemical reaction in your brain without having to do drugs, right? Like these are the stories. This is what stories exist for. And so, um, yeah, I think I think you and I are in, in a lot of agreement on that. Anything else that you'd want to add to that? Uh, I would just say that um, stories are relational when you said oxytocin. So that's mm. the that's the hug hormone. When you touch yeah. someone or get a hug, that oxytocin is what's released in your brain. So mm. stories uh, are having an effect on your brain, like getting a hug from someone. It's a, it's a relational act. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's not, uh, there are other reasons, the empathy, mirror neurons, all of that sort of stuff, but right. we are relational beings. And uh, I, I mean, I think we're more aware of that this year than we have ever been before. I, I had the I don't know, 20th introvert this summer tell me last night, like, you know, I was good for three or four months and now I just miss people. Um, You know, like we're aware that we are relational beings and in a way that we took for granted before. And um, stories are one of the ways that we feed that. Mm, Yeah, that's well said. Um, Yeah, and we're always, we are always engaged. I mean, oral storytelling is one of the most original forms of storytelling. And we do that just naturally. We, we tell, I will tell you that if you can go find a YouTube video of Jamie Foxx telling any story, you will be <laughs> just sucked in to whatever world that he's creating. I was, we, my wife and I clicked on a YouTube video yesterday. It was recommended to us. And it was him talking about um, what he learned from working with some of the different actors that, that he's worked with or some of the different directors that he's worked with. It was like a round table from the Hollywood Reporter, actually, if you want to go watch it. And here's Jamie Foxx and just talking about a few things 
and is able to just draw you in via oral storytelling to going like, wow, I did not think I would be interested on Christoph Waltz's way of looking at a piece of paper. But Jamie Foxx made that one of the most relevant things I've heard today, right? Um, and so we tell each other stories all the time. And those that are those of us who really enjoy that process are constantly doing that so that we can derive understanding from other people and 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 create shared experiences. Mm -hmm. I think that that's all just super, super cool. Um, it's yeah. one of the reasons why I love storytelling. Um, well, let's get, let's get, let's get into a little further down. Cause otherwise I'll start ranting about propaganda if I <laughs> talk about anything else. Um, let's, but let's, let's go actually farther into technique. So what are some of the writing techniques that you like to use to engage people from the very beginning of your latest stories? What are some of the things you've used? And then you've also seen being used by others that you find like, Hey, that's a really good technique. I really enjoy that style. Um, well, you know, I think that there's four, there's actually four places a story starts. Mm. Um, and so your techniques are going to be a little different in each one of those, but there's the point where it starts for you, where you yeah. have the idea for a story. Um, then there's the point where it begins to exist, where mm. the first words have been put on screen or on page. Um, then there's when it begins to exist for your reader as they mm. pick it up and read it. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I said four, but there's I mean, it's actually five, and then one, and then when it exists for your, if you're doing comics, your viewer slash reader, because they are mm -hmm. viewing it and reading it. Um, in the film world, an, an editor would probably be similar to this. Your viewer reader, and uh, and then finally for film and TV, when it begins for your viewer. Mm -hmm. So, because in in film, you have a reader beforehand. Those are the people you're trying to sell the screenplay to or right. that are, you're making the movie with. So you have readers, but then you also have viewers. Mm. Um, and so <laughs> each one of those is a beginning. And um, so when it begins for you, uh, I think the technique is, <laughs> I don't, you know, how do you come up with ideas? That's mm. the, people always want to know. And, and the, answer is you just come up with ideas. They're everywhere in the world. Um, <clears throat> so any image, any idea, something that sparks just your imagination. And, um, and it's usually when, at least for me, it's usually when you're not suspecting it. I'm not sitting down like, I am going to come up with a story. What, by the time I sit down, I'm like, well, I've had been having these ideas floating around for months. Like what, which one will be the next one? Um, then there's where it begins existing. And uh, this is a huge, huge hurdle. Mm -hmm. And a lot of writers and aspiring writers get separated at this stage. Aspiring writers just never face that blank page. And, um, and writers will sit down and do it. Um, and, I, you know, technique wise, my advice is just murder the first, murder your um, blank page. Just put anything on it. Now it's not a blank page anything at all just the title your story your name um you know um anything anything like that and you have begun it's no longer a blank page it gets that much easier so murder your blank page um <laughs> and then um you know one other thing that that comes to mind and this is kind of a version of murdering your blank page just not having a blank page um and that is uh i've talked before about vicky king's book um how to write a movie in 21 days which is just it's the worst title, but um, <laughs> but the first fifty pages of that book are great, and um, she 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 suggests an exercise which I had a lot of um, success with early on, mm -hmm. and she says get one hundred and twenty sheets of paper, um, bind them together, hmm. print your title page, put it on top. Now you can hold your script in your hand, even though all one hundred and twenty <laughs> pages are blank. And then you, you, you know, you write five pages, you put them in, in the first five pages, and then you slowly just, you, you fill that up. But the whole time you're holding this physical thing and you're, so you're, it's not just a blank page. It's not a conceptual, you know, you've made this conceptual thing, a mm. thing that lives. Um, uh, so s s anything along those lines, anything along those lines, just, yeah. um, we get hung up thinking about the blank page, but it's so easy to no longer have a blank page in front of you. Right. Uh, the title of your story will do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. That's awesome. And so, yeah. so are, are any other techniques that you recommend? I mean, that, that's a great one. Just, just um, start writing. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's what, so that's when it begins to exist. Mm 
Yeah. Um, so we talked about when it starts to exist for uh, like when it comes to you now, when it begins to exist now, when it begins to exist for your reader, mm. this is another thing. And, mm. um, I, I think, um, Christine Catherine Rush and Dean Wesley Smith, they talk about, they teach this in, in they, the term that they use is depth. Um, and they're, <laughs> they're some of the most selling and most award-winning prose writers you, ha, of all time. And they, the metaphor that they use is depth, is that you want to pull your reader to the bottom of the lake mm. and then pull them across the bottom of the lake. <laughs> and because at the bottom of the lake, it's really hard for them to surface and leave your story. If you only pull them in a little ways, it's easy for them to surface and walk away. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't pull them at all, they're already on the surface. Um, but if you pull them in and you, mm -hmm. you do a deep, just suck them in with your with the depth of your story in the first um, three, four hundred words or so, then it's just then it's that much harder for them to get out. And then it's mm -hmm. um, it's almost more maintaining the depth than having to keep pulling your reader in. You're just mm -hmm. pulling them across. Um, now, the ways that you create depth, um, uh, I'm going to talk about it in a few different ways. So in pr like prose fiction, mm -hmm. um, y you know, you do this with mainly through your character. Um, a story is a character in a setting with a problem. Um, but the setting and the setting and the problem and your character together sort of will create the depth. They pull us in. We feel like we're in a place. We feel like we are with a person. And uh, because of the way our brains work, we are empathizing with them, facing their problem, and we want to help. We want to help them solve it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and but the main way that you do that is through your. The reason I call this a character thing is is it's through your character's opinions. Mm -hmm. um, it's all through your character's opinions. The details that you choose when you're describing a tree, the the words and the ways you describe the tree, those are unique to your character, not to you as an author. Um, most stories are written in limited third person. And so you're choosing the details that are kind of coming through your character's opinions. Um, and that creates depth very quickly. You can also do it with voice, um, strong voice, like uh, Raymond Chandler is a great example of that. Uh, just, you just want to, that person just starts talking and you're just sucked in. Yeah. Um, you can do it with a summary. It's a little harder, um, just sort of summarizing the world. Um, uh, I read a short story recently by Kevin J. Anderson that did this very well. Mm. Just sort of like a macro look at the world and then it comes, hones down, starts the story. Um, and then um, pacing, mm. uh, what it looks like on the page um, affects uh, whether someone gets pulled in. If, if it's just like page after page of block text, uh, that's harder. Mm. But if, the, if, if there's paragraph breaks, when there should be paragraph breaks and visually it doesn't look overwhelming, it just, it's easier for a story to get sucked, for a reader to get sucked in. Mm. Um, so fiction wise depth and, and what we, I guess all of it's going to be a version of depth, but basically you want to suck them in, <laughs> you want to suck a reader in as soon as possible because, and as deep as possible, and then it makes it harder for them, uh, then they're going to be in your story. Um, for nonfiction, I, I like the way that uh, a, a blogger and writer and entrepreneur named James Altucher, I believe mm -hmm. is how it's pronounced. He talked about it um, and he says, he says, it will, whatever you're writing will always be better if you go back and delete the first paragraph. Your second, par <laughs> your second paragraph will always be a better opening than your first paragraph. And it will still be true even if you know this role. Um, <laughs> and, and I've tried it and, and he's right. Like our, our brains just need a minute to warm up to what we're talking about. And that first paragraph is almost always our brains warming up mm. as writers, even if we are trying to start as late as possible. Uh, the second paragraph is usually a stronger place to start. So mm. that's a technique, particularly for nonfiction. Try it with your fiction, you mm. know, um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, that's more idea oriented stuff, I think. Um, right. With, with fiction, you want to create depth right away in the first sentence as much as possible. Mm. Um, and then scripts comic scripts and screenplays have uh, another element of depth and it's, this is related to pacing. Mm. Um, but this is just how the script looks. Um, does it look attractive? Uh, the way that the words are laid out on the page, is there too much negative space? Is there not enough negative space? Are there huge chunks of text, um, mm. that are, that bog you down? Are there, and if they do bog you down, are you supposed to be bogged down right there? Is it for a reason? If not, like, you know, um, 
how long does your dialogue go on? You know, you know, you can you can see the with screenplays, you can see the rhythm of a scene before you read it. That's true. You yeah. see the rhythm of the scene, and so with scripts, there's a visual element um, of depth, which is what what your pages look like. Um, mm. So that's when it begins for your reader, <laughs> uh, and then for your reader slash viewer, this is comic specific. Um, uh, you have another option, and that is just to begin with a really interesting visual. It's a mm -hmm. visual storytelling medium. Any any interesting visual it can be anything really. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are some other elements. Style is important. The style mm -hmm. of the art, uh, and by by which I really mean the emotional effect of the art. Um, mm -hmm. And the two main components of this are the colors. Uh, colors are shown, documented to have very specific emotional effects on us. Yeah. And um, this, the, ex the level of expressionism, like how realistic is it and how, or how expressionistic is it? Mm. But if it's on the expressionistic end, we are going to identify more with it. You know, like mm. when we see a circle with two dots and a, and a line, <laughs> we see it as a face. Right. We, we identify with that, even though there's almost nothing there. But then the more realistic the art gets, the more specific it is, the more you are watching it, because that's obviously not you, mm. right? But you can identi you identify more with a, with a more expressionistic type of art. So, um, so style, by which I mostly mean colors and expressionism, level of expressionism. And then finally would be storytelling, mm. which is how many panels are on a page, how do they relate to one another? Um, is, is it intuitive to follow with your eyes? Do they choose the right moments uh, to put in the gutter for your brain to complete the actions? Mm. Um, all of that sort of stuff. Will, so all of that will affect the, the depth of, of a reader within the first page. Mm. Um, now, the style, the storytelling, a lot of that is on your artist's shoulders. you know. Mm. But mm. as a writer, you can describe interesting visuals. You can, um, you can suggest or designate how many panels should be on that first page. You can talk about if, you know, which panel you think should be the largest. You can talk about colors and, and style with the artist, with the colorist. Um, mm -hmm. And then they are reading your script. So the, the going back to your reader reading a script, whether it's a screenplay or a comic, you can also, by the way you create your, you, are, you can create depth with prose, with your words, for them. And when they're sucked into your story, their visuals will more closely reflect your story. Um, so you're, you're not trying to give them, you're not trying to just give them a blueprint. You're also trying to pull them in um, mm. and your collaborators. And then finally, sorry, I know this is, I'm going on for a long time. I had too no, much I like time. It. I had too much time to think about this this morning. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the mistake. Um, and then when it begins for your viewer, and, and this is all, it's, I'm bringing this back to technique, I promise. Mm -hmm. But um, I, just this morning, I just sat down and I thought, well, wh what kinds of, so the prose stuff, the reader stuff, the comic stuff, none of that quite works for film, um, which I think a lot of people who watch this are, are interested in film and screenwriting. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started thinking, well, like what kind of, you know, what techniques do some of my favorite stories use to pull me in? And mm. then I tried to sort of create a, I don't know, a, a, um, a categorization of them. So I'm going to, oh, list, I love I'm, it. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to list types just in my one, you know, brainstorming this morning. I no guarantee that any of this, is, I will still believe any of this tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but in my brainstorming this morning, I, here's the types of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, eight types of story with, um, I'd say, I don't know, like seven subtypes. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. Sorry, every here's my taxonomy of film and TV openings. Um, I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> first is the premise. Mm. The opening is about the premise mm. that's going to make the story work. And some examples of that are Lost mm. um, and Elf. Mm. Um, there. Now, all of these, you're going to be, you're introducing characters, you're introducing tone, you're introducing theme, all of that's coming out in your, but they're always going to be, one of them is going to be in the front. 
So there's the premise forward opening, I guess, which is mm -hmm. Lost or Elf. And it's like, here is a situation. Right. You know, here's a circumstance. Um, and that pulls you in if it's an interesting enough circumstance uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Then there is what I would call the engine forward opening. And that is, that's primarily with TV mm -hmm. because you have to, in your first episode, you have to create a storytelling engine so that your viewers will know, oh, you know what, this, this show can sustain itself. This show has a reason to go past this first episode. Mm -hmm. um, and engine is, is, is what you'll often hear people call that. So pilots in general tend to be uh, engine forward openings, um, creating the engine by which this, will, this, will, this show will generate idea after idea, episode after episode ep after episode. Mm -hmm. um, some great examples are the Luther pilot, one of the best pilots of all time. Um, and the river pilot, hmm. uh, which I just love. So those are, I think those are both on Netflix, Luther and river, amazing pilots. If you want to watch how to begin a series, well, those are great. Um, and then film series do sort of have this as well. Marvel universe, Iron Man is kind of a pilot, hmm. uh, uh, fast and furious, the story engine of family and fast cars gets introduced in the beginning. Um, engine is kind of literal in this one, but, um, <laughs> like, but that engine, the, the, those, the intersection of family and fast cars mm -hmm. has driven nine movies to this point, I think. Um, and so those are in engine introducing, uh, engine forward openings. Then you have the hero forward opening. Mm -hmm. Uh, the classic is Indiana Jones where you see how great Indy is at what he does and you learn so much about him as a person, you learn he's afraid of snakes and all, all of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and then going back to when I was talking about comics and there's also just the cool visual of the big round boulder, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like that, that just, it's stuck in all of our imaginations ever since. <laughs> totally. Um, <laughs> um, and then there's the villain forward opening. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, this would be the opening of Star Wars New Hope. Mm. Um, which is really that opening scene is really about Vader um, mm -hmm. more than anything else. And then there is the, there's a, there's a subtype to the, both the hero and the villain, um, which I, I would call it the performance forward opening. Mm. Um, a great example of that is Iron Man. Robert Downey Jr.'s performance is more mm. important than the character of Tony Stark in the mm. opening of that movie. Um, that's what arrests and pulls your attention in. And then, so that's a hero version of a performance forward opening and mm -hmm. a villain version of a performance forward opening would be Dark Knight, uh, the opening yes. scene where we meet Joker. Um, Cause it's, it's Heath Ledger's performance that really pulls us in. I immediately thought of <laughs> so that. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, then there's the world building forward opening um, where the world is being built more than anything else. It's not a particular circumstance. It's not necessarily a character, but it's the way all of these things weave together. Mm. Um, alias. Uh, this is often pilots as well, mm. um, you know, um, because you're building a world that's going to have to last for a long time. Right. The alias pilot is a great example of this. Um, the Riverdale pilot is a great example of this mm. and the Westworld pilot. These are all great examples of world building. Interesting. And then there's the cousin to a world building, which I'm calling the world telling uh, forward opening. Mm. And so that's when you're actually told the premise. Um, uh, so Star Wars New Hope does this with the scroll. Yep. It like, here's several paragraphs. We're just telling you where, where <laughs> right. you are and what you're doing. He's um, bad. He's good. <laughs> just, just know that going in. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, T2 does mm. that. Um, and Reign of Fire does mm. that where they catch you up on what the world is. They catch mm -hmm. you up. Um, Lord of the Rings does that too. Yeah. And so, I mean, the key here is that it's gotta be interesting. It's yeah. gotta be interesting. Um, and there usually have to be some great visuals to go with it. Um, as Star Wars got away with just text on a screen, you know, but T2, you've got robots stepping on human skulls <laughs> that, are, yeah. that are littering a playground. You know what I mean? Like th those are, <laughs> those are really arresting visuals. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and so then there's the theme forward opening um, and, and the masterclass in the theme opening is the first scene of Alien Covenant. Oh, um, I haven't seen uh, Alien Covenant. Uh, just so even if you don't like the alien movies, if you don't like science fiction, if you don't like horror, yeah. just watch the opening scene. Cause mm. um, 
the theme of the entire film is so well done. You just want, it's so fascinating and it shouldn't, I'm like, it shouldn't necessarily be fascinating when you consider what actually happens and, <laughs> and where they actually are, but it just, it's the theme. It introduces a, a theme that you just cannot escape and that mm. the entire rest of the film will unpack in both wonderful and horrific ways. Um, mm. Mm. And, and then finally is the tone forward opening where you're just giving people a tone of your story. They don't really have information yet. They don't really have characters yet. They don't even know a theme yet. All these will be related to tone, of course, but, um, and I, and there's five types of the, of tone openings that I could think of. And I'm so these are the last ones I promise. No, no, no I, love um, it, I love it. But there's the genre tone where you just, you, um, an action film usually starts with an action scene. A slasher film usually starts with someone getting killed. Um, and so it just tells you, here's your genre. Um, you know what I mean? And so, but, but really what genre is at that point is tone. It's telling you, you know, what your expectations are in, in the story, what things will feel right in the story and what won't. Right. Um, then there's the credit sequence as tone. Um, Twin Peaks is an oh, excellent yeah. example of this. Yeah, the, yeah, that, yeah. Those Twin Peaks credits have nothing to do with the story, but it pulls you into the tone of that world so well, the combination of the music and the visuals. Mm. Um, then there's the musical. This is kind of related to genre, but uh, the musical, t um, setting the tone for your musical, it, Musicals almost always have a song right there at the beginning. So, yeah. uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, La La Land, um, and and they're telling you a little bit more than I guess. I mean, I guess it's genre, but usually it's world building as well. It's usually a world building song. So there's you know a lot of that's why I didn't quite call it just a, a genre tone opening. Um, and then there's the cold open. Um, which this is at, goes in at the beginning of most episodes of serialized TV in the traditional network format, particularly where there's commercials. And this would be two minutes before the commercial. You still, it's still a very useful technique. So you'll still see it done in even in streaming shows and all that sort of stuff. But that's just those two minutes that really grab your attention. Uh, they often involve characters that have nothing to do with the rest of the story, mm. you know, it, but there, it just sets the tone. Um, Buffy, the pilot of Buffy is a great example of this. Mm. Um, you have a short little cold open. Um, the characters are not important to the series, um, but it tells you immediately what you can expect from the show, that it's going to play with your expectations, that it's going to um, have, um, it's going to approach gender in a different way than this genre has done in the past. It tells you all of that in two minutes, the tone. Mm. Um, and then finally, I would say the metaphorical opening. And we've talked about this before, but the the shot of the rabbits at the beginning of Us oh, yeah. is a uh, metaphorical uh, and also kind of a credits. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So the, the reason I list out all of these is just, first of all, just to show there are so many ways you can open your story. There's so many techniques you can use. Mm. And so what I recommend as, a, as the technique is, which of them is the most arresting or interesting about your story? Mm. Is it the tone? Mm. Is it the world? Is it the premise? Is it your hero? Is it your villain? Is it an actor that you have attached? Is it the tone or the genre or the theme? What is the most interesting? What creates the most depth by itself? Mm. Like even just when you're visually, when, when you're just like telling people orally, like what, what is the moment that clicks when they're like, oh, I want to see that. Their eyes yeah. light up and you're like, oh, that's what it is. Yes, exactly. So f what is that for your story? Mm. And then do that kind of opening. So if it's the world, then do a world building opening. If it's, mm. uh, you know, if it's your theme, do a theme opening. If it's your characters, do a character opening, that sort of thing. So all of that crazy taxonomy just to say, which one is the strongest in your story? What really uh, sucks people in? Um, and you can find this out usually by just telling people and you can tell when they get interested. Um, and you're like, okay, so that's the thing that makes them want to watch this or hear this story. And, um, and another version of this is when I send a script out for notes, I ask people, um, does every page want to make you want to read the next page? And if not, when does it first not happen? That's a great question. And, um, 
And so then you'll know you've, you've, you've taken a wrong turn there at the beginning. And it's usually in, it's usually in your first 10 pages, right? Um, and okay, that's all I have to say about technique. Yeah. Sorry, that was yeah. a really long answer. I love it. No, I, I, I <laughs> pick up on some of the things that you talked about. Um, but just to, before I go there, uh, obviously, like you were talking about too, you can you can incorporate a couple of different of those options sometimes because you mentioned a new hope, which mm -hmm. starts to crawl but then goes straight into the villain. Um, and so you, there are ways to maybe even blend some of those together um, in different ways. You know, can you have a tone that it's all centered around your villain? Obviously, the tone uh, of the Dark Knight is a lot different than the tone of Batman Begins. I mean, mm -hmm. there's similarities, but there's some big differences as well. And so I think that that's really fun that you can even take a couple of different things and mash them up um, to create effective beginnings, which is which is a really cool technique as well. Yeah, and you, you're, you'll be using ultimately all of these in your first five right. to ten pages, no matter what. Yeah. But but there will there will be the those two the one or two that just like really move forward, you know? Because yeah, Alien Covenant, it's really a theme and a villain introduction, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Absolutely. Luther is really a an engine and a hero. You know what I mean? Like, um, right. yeah. I think too, um, just to back up what you were saying about when you start to show people your story, I actually am, uh, this, this comes from a little bit, not necessarily from my writing background, but taking my startup background, starting like starting different companies and, and then applying some of that thinking to my writing. I will actually even now start to, um, almost like pitch people an elevator pitch about my idea, just kind of, kind of like how you were saying before I've even started to put anything on paper. And one of the reasons I do that is because I'm looking for what people, what makes people light up, but I'm also looking for who am I writing this story for? Cause I have to write it for myself, but who, who are the people that are like me who will love this story? And if I see somebody light up with a 30 second elevator pitch, then I go, oh, they let, they lit up about this specific aspect of what I said. And so now I can go say that to the next person and see if they light up. And if they don't, I just have to keep in mind that I'm not necessarily writing. So if I, if I pitch it to you and you go, okay, I go, ah, does that mean that I have a really bad idea? Or does that just mean that Caleb is not interested in my idea, right? And yeah. Just be the latter. And so I had to figure out like, okay, well, how do I, as this story starts to, to take shape in my head, and then as it starts to, to end up on paper, who am I actually writing this story for is a really important question because you don't want to be like chasing all the people, right? Like if if, right. if 10 people make it through your first page and you're like, I was, it was riveting. And then, the, then another 10 people go, you know, I made it to about half the first page, but I just wasn't interested. I think you, it, it could be a big mistake depending on who you're writing this for, or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, if you're writing it for Star Wars, then maybe all 10 people need, or all 20 people need to be <laughs> to love it. Yeah. If you're writing this for a smaller production house, or if you're writing this for yourself, or if you're writing this for a niche audience, which I usually recommend if you're, especially if you're going to self-publish it or self-produce it, um, then ignore the other 10 people who didn't like it and go, of the 10 people who really loved it, then make sure that you massage it with them in mind because they're right. likely to want to. I am specifically writing this for people who like, time travel romance stories you know or whatever whatever it is and then exactly. so then go to people you know who like time travel romance stories and tell them your idea and if it doesn't click with them you maybe go back to the drawing board but uh <laughs> but if you go to someone who likes um historical fiction or like doesn't like romance or whatever you know it's the wrong person to yeah. even even if your idea is the best idea yeah exactly exactly right um, so I'm going to start with the actually the end of my notes here, and then I'll circle back to some of my other notes um, when it comes to the techniques that I like to use to start my stories, but also the ones I love that other people use. Um, and one of those, I have to bring up a story that I heard on NPR. I heard it on, uh, obviously, the radio. And um, it was a young singer who had just started to climb into uh, some... some uh, bigger areas of her career and she described this aspect of singing that i thought was so important for storytellers that i thought i would tell the story that she told and i wish i could remember her name i do not have any clue what her name was um but she talked about how as a younger singer she used to focus on just hitting the high note 
And so she would know that the high note was coming. She had practiced the high note. She was ready to unleash the high note on the audience and, and, and be able to do that ex extraordinarily well. And she was approached by some older performers and they would say like, Hey, it's not just about the high note. Like it's about, it's about everything that becomes before the high note as well. And she goes, um, the way she described the story was very wise as a person who had figured this out over time. But she goes, um, at, at first she was like, what are they talking about? Like all the audience cares about is the high note. That's what makes me look good. That's what they like to hear when I get to that place. Um, basically the climax of this number. Uh, and then what she realized later and the way that she described this was, was, was just, uh, cause she started using science to describe it. And I think this is really, really cool because the way that, that science and art interact with one another is really fascinating to me. But she said, what I realized that what they were saying was, is that rather than try to take the audience from maybe here and then here and hit them with a dopamine hit at this level, because that's what the audience will receive when they get yeah. that, that surging note, right? That surging high note, they're going to get this surge of dopamine in their brains. And, this, and then, then that will cause the emotional response in them. What she realized that the older performers were telling her was that you actually need to build up the dopamine in the person's brain as opposed to just smacking them in the face with it. Because if they go straight, she was basically the way she described it. If I go straight for the high note, then I get a certain amount of dopamine. But if I build their dopamine levels that the dopamine is just almost as if it's like surging and it's about to overflow. And then I hit the high note, they get this giant emotional response that is just um, really, really powerful to hit them with. And so I, I love that aspect of thinking about your story in that way where the art meets the science. Uh, we talked about this already with, with brain chemistry, oh. but how are you building the, the brain chemistry in the early moments so that when you hit them with the bigger moment, it's just a release of chemical that goes, wow, that's, I did not see that coming. Wow. That is so heroic. Wow. That really floors me. Now I'm crying. All, all of these things, you get that payoff by having something that came before it that was meaningful. And so a lot of what you just described in your techniques are things that you can utilize to start to start to get people to that place where later on you can capitalize on that. And I just thought that, that was such a cool way of her describing that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously has stuck with me. Um, so a couple of things, I broke mine down the same way you broke yours down um, in terms of like what you, there's, there are things you do before your writing even begins. And the one thing that I am going to talk about on this show a lot, just because it's, it's really something that I'm more passionate about, especially as we get into a more, I think it's hard when you, when you don't recognize how polarizing things are getting is that we live in such a curated world that my YouTube app tells me what I've already liked or, or even what I've already hated and then just gives me more stuff like that because they're trying to get me to have those emotional connections in my brain with the content that they're able to produce to me or, or produce for me. And, and so they're just trying to get me to click and to watch and it's all based on numbers and things like that but it's also based on the way your brain reacts to those numbers. So they're trying to figure out the art and the science and they're turning an AI loose on you to figure out what that looks like. Um, I think that writers need to think about those aspects of who they're writing for, but they also need to take into account that exploration should be a huge part of their writing process. And when I say exploration, what I mean is don't go in with a message, almost go in with something that you want to explore. If, you, if, a, if a message hits you, then go, I want to write about, you know, whatever it is. I want to write about, uh, take, a, take a topic from the headlines, right? I want to talk about um, bigotry in America. Okay, if you're going to do that, that's awesome. I'm glad that you were inspired by that. Don't go in with a message. You might have instantly a message. I have a message as soon as I think about that, right? I, my first response to that is, uh, let's condemn white supremacy. <laughs> let's, because these are news topics right now. Let's make sure that we go after the problems in the world and resolve those problems. However, if I go in with that message, I miss a lot of what will actually make that story come to life. So I would say, go in with a desire 
to see the problem from as many angles as you possibly can. Don't go in, you know, if you're going to look at it, if you're going to describe an elephant, there's the old parable of, well, someone's describing, if, if, if you take seven or seven or eight blind people and have them describe an ele elephant, one's going to describe the tail, one's going to describe a, a leg, one's going to describe the trunk, and they're all going to describe a very different creature. Your job as the author, in my opinion, is to be in each one of those seats and go, oh, interesting, there's a tail. And then, oh, interesting, there's this leg. Oh, interesting, I didn't realize there was a trunk and an ear. Um, and once you get the full picture, then you can really start to understand where the wisdom is when you come to tackle that topic. Um, and I think that you actually owe that not only to society, um, but I think you actually owe it to the characters who will be in your story as well. Um and I think that that puts, of course, what I'm doing is I'm putting a lot of pressure on the writer's shoulders. But honestly, I don't think writers should start stories that they haven't really dug deeper into to realize where the hurt and the problem is coming inside them, but where the hurt and the problem is coming from other people as well. Um, and then and then wrestling with that over time. So that's one thing that I would recommend before you even start putting, you can, you can start putting words on the page, but you're gonna have to wrestle with those words as you go throughout your story. Um, you want to comment on that? Well, I was just going to say another way to think about that, just to give someone else a different mm -hmm. hook to hang their hat on, is um, is the de is to debate it in your story. Um, and I, I can't even remember who said this, but it might have actually been Vicky King. But basically, ask the question: Do you have a scene where your characters debate the theme? Um, you know, where you have one, <laughs> you have characters who have different perspectives on whatever this theme is that you're exploring in your, in your story and actually debate it. You know, um, uh, uh, this is, it's actually fair. It's really common to have that. And, um, so also just to think of it as a, maybe you don't have to explore every aspect of something, but your antagonist and your protagonist can each just have a different stance and it's the conflict between their two stances. Um, yeah. yeah. And not only that, but the conflict between there. So this is what I mean by being fair. So let's mm -hmm. just let's just say that we're going to take two sides of the issue, like you're saying. Like there's two two characters, they're going to be debating one another. What I think is unfair is if you were to take one character's perspective, the character that you believe is the right perspective, and to give them all the ammunition, and to give them all the things that make sense, to give them all the reasons why the other character is hor a horrific villain, right? Um, what is what is more interesting and more fascinating is if you actually look at it from both sides and say, well, why would this character think this? It's the difference between having Ronan the Accuser as your villain and Thanos as your villain. Um, we just go, Ronan is just a you know, mustache twirling villain and he, they told us he was one, so I guess he is one. Whereas Thanos comes in and says, look at the pain that I've had in my life. I don't want this pain inflicted on the rest of the universe. Nobody else is willing to do what I'm willing to do. So I guess I have to do it. Um, now, that doesn't mean Thanos is right in his perspective. Obviously, we have the rest of the Avengers to, to, to go to battle with him to, to, to fight that perspective. But what it does mean is that the writers of that film have taken the time to say there's a reason and a rationale that people would feel this way, even if we believe that they're wrong in the end. Um, and I think that you owe it to your characters to to do that. So if you're going to have that debate scene, um, then that's a really good way of, of, of inclu including that kind of thing is to be to be fair to your characters um, and give them reasons for backing up their argument, even if you think their argument is bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Justin in the comments just said exorcism of Emily Rose is an interesting Halloween themed example of the debate. Um, and I think he hit on something great, which is basically every courtroom drama is a debate movie. Literally, you have people debating um, a particular moral quandary. Um, and it can be funny, like Adam's rib. Um, it can be frightening, like Exorcism of Emily Rose. It can be, um, uh, it can really make you th question <laughs> your own self um a few good men i think does a very good job of that you know um uh but yeah the courtroom drama is the debate writ large it, that is that is what your story is and uh i think that's part of why it's such an enduring story form uh, yeah if we start to strip nuance out of, out of storytelling i think that we we really ruin we, we ruin society because in, in a way when we strip nuance out of something 
we then can more easily paint heroes and villains in our own image. Well, we're not trying to paint heroes and villains in our own image. We're trying to get to a place where we can unite with other people and approach other people and get to a better place. Well, if you're only solving the problem by just crushing your villains because they're inherently evil, um, you're not doing the work. You're not doing any of the work that it actually takes to to engage um, culture and society. So I just think that that's really important. Um, now, before I continue, because we I have a few more thoughts here, but we have a whole other question, but I know that we're coming up on three o'clock. So how, how much extra time do you have? I'm good. Okay. So we'll just keep going. We'll keep going. Two, just two people <laughs> on the podcast. And we, we're so passionate about this stuff. We'll go for a long time. <laughs> So I, I tend to start with one of two techniques when I start a story. And, and basically, what the, all of the different techniques that you described are probably embedded in what I'm about to say. And that is that I either start with conflict right off the bat, or I start with the promise of conflict to come. Um, and so, for example, in the latest story that, I, that is, we're going to have come out called Death of a Bounty Hunter, um, it starts out with literally a, a fist fight where there is a racist villain trying to crush one underneath him with his two steel hands. Um, and he's trying to kill someone. Um, that is inherent conflict. The reason I chose to go straight to conflict in that story is because uh, it is prose and an audiobook. And in prose and an audiobook, I feel like, just like you talked about all the differences in the mediums that we're, that we have available to us, I feel like prose can get really boring if you're trying to play with the promise of conflict. You have to be so articulate with your words and, and so interesting with your words that a lot of times I get super bored when a story starts that I'm actually reading. Whereas if, it, if there are visuals to it, then my brain can already start going like, well, why is that visual there? Why is this important to me? Why is there a room full of rabbits? And why is the music creepy? Like there's, there's different emotions that are engaged and different senses that are engaged that get me to a place where my senses are heightened and I'm anticipating, I'm building up the dopamine, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think prose has that as much. Um, obviously, some people have done that really well in prose in the past, but I'm not as good at that. So I like to start with just driving home the in media rest, as they would say, in the, start in the middle of things. And in this case, conflict. Um, but I do think that in screenwriting, the actual, the other approach is actually my preferred, uh, approach. And that is because of what I just mentioned about you being able to see things, you being able to hear things and that gets you going. Right. Um, and so we've talked about this several times on this show, but inglorious bastards is being one of those moments where the promise of conflict is there, but there is inherently not that much conflict. I mean, the whole time the start of Inglorious Bastards, we have the Nazis come to a house. Underneath the house, they're hiding Jews. That whole scene is incredibly tense. And, and one of the things that Tarantino does in that scene is he just keeps drawing it out. And you're like, how can you draw this out any further? This is insane. Um, and that, that is the promise of conflict. Uh, and the promise of conflict is going like, okay, there's not, there's not active conflict. But that latent conflict, the fact that we know that they're there and that this guy may or may not know that they're there is so incredibly intense. Um, another, another example of that from a beginning of a film, which I think is one of the best beginnings of a film of all time, is actually Once Upon a Time in the West, um, which is also another long, drawn-out scene with very little dialogue, um, whereas Inglorious Bastards has a lot of dialogue in that scene. I love silent openings. <laughs> Because silent openings get all of your other emotions involved before you actually start to hear people talk. Um, and that's basically what you were calling like a tone opening, very similar to that. Um, and that Once Upon a Time in the West is that because all of these guys show up and we know that there's a train coming in. And we don't know why those guys are there, but it's not good. <laughs> there's, there's something that's going to happen with that that's not good. Um, so I really like that the either having go straight into conflict or promise conflict. Um, and, and, and your different methodologies really go alongside that into saying like we're either promising conflict or we have conflict there right in front of us so so anything else you want to you want to say about technique i don't think so yeah we covered technique in fact we could probably do <laughs> each one of these openings that we've discussed <laughs> on that um but i want to get into this third question and we'll end we'll end after this third question and that is that, um, so the way, this, the, the way that our show is going to be formatted from here on out is that the first question is going to be about beyond technique, what are the implications to our audience, to culture, to society at large of stories and storytelling? 
The second question is going to be about specific techniques that writers can use to draw people, draw audiences in, draw society and culture in, wrestle through those things. Um, and the third question is going to be more about the internal focus of the writer and the writer's ability um, to do these things, do these things well without completely destroying themselves in the process. And that's a, that's a particular passion of Caleb. He, he does a lot of talking about that. Um, and, and I want to unearth a lot of that wisdom from, from him. I'm not going to have a lot of wisdom for you. Probably. I'll do what I can. I'll that's, what I can. that's what I want all creative writing programs to actually teach you. Um, mm -hmm. The craft can be picked up and it's usually picked up more from reading than it is from someone telling you a technique. Um, yeah. But but just knowing the emotional gauntlet that, that you're going to be running and creating this thing, um, uh, I think there's uh, that so many people just wash up on the shores of those <laughs> of those emotional rocks and, and we never yeah. see them. Yeah. Well, I tend to have I tend to have such a uh, forward moving motion in my writing that I forget some of these things. And, and sometimes what's, what can happen is you can forget some of these things until it's too late. And, and basically your story is just it's gone because because you're gone. Right. Like you've wasted yourself. So your story's not available to the world anymore. So when we look at the mental, emotional, spiritual impact of writing, even the physical impact of writing, what should writers and storytellers prepare for when they set out to start a new story? What are some good practices and what are some pitfalls pertaining to the writers themselves? Uh, okay, so I have four, <laughs> four little areas where I think that this sort of plays out. So one is starting a new story. Hmm. The other is resuming your story every day. So at your daily start, um, most stories take more than a day to write, uh, particularly films, novels, things like that. It's gonna be a long relationship to this, to writing this thing. And so those, the, your daily start becomes more, far more important than just the, your initial start that happened way back. Um, and then I would say there's the restarting of your story um, which is when you, once you've finished your first draft and you actually know what your story is about, it's about going back and making the beginning, um, uh, uh, carry that, you know, carry the weight of that in the way that it should and which it didn't when you first wrote it. Cause you were still figuring out what your story was about. Right. Um, and then I'm going to talk about something which, and then starting the rest of your life. So when you're done writing, actually getting on with life, um, <laughs> uh, like how do you not always be writing? Mm -hmm. um, because that's a, I think that's a, that's a pitfall that we fall into. We, we visit this world that we are creating. We go all the way to another world. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then how do you get back, um, right. to get back to your life here in this world? Mm -hmm. Um, so starting your, I'll, I'll, I'll just do these one at a time and then hear what you hear, what your thoughts are on that right. area. And then, so that it's not just me talking for a very long time, like it was before. Um, so starting your story overall. Hmm. sitting down it's day one beginning your story uh i think that it, i think it's a, useful to think of this as falling in love hmm. um you are going to fall in love with your story hmm. uh you are and so um it's just you need to spend time with it hmm. the same way that you would spend time with a person hmm. and so starting your story, give yourself some time, set aside some time in your schedule. Mm. Um, it, if you want an easy place to get to find time, it's uh, just delete it from your TV watching time, which most people watch like four hours a day. Um, uh, and then set aside time so that you can fall in love with your story. Um, you like it right now. You think it's really cool. You're excited about it, but only love is going to carry you through the weeks and months to come. The, the false starts, um, the, the, just, just the whole story crashing down around you. Only love will do that. <laughs> so fall in love with your story. Um, and then I, I would say, uh, what works well for a lot of writers too, is to write out of order. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Write what you're excited to write today. Uh, mm. A different version of you and a different version of your brain kind of shows up every day. And today's version of you may not be able to handle the scene you thought you were going to be writing today. <laughs> um, so jump, jump to the scene that your brain is 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 ready for today and that you're uh, most excited about. Because going back to the the sort of that blank page, 
I think the, the probably the most important tool in a writer's toolbox mm. is momentum. Mm. Um, momentum more than anything else. So if you can get yourself writing every day, get yourself writing regularly, just moving the story forward, writing out of order is a great way to get momentum because we're not always ready to go to scene three and then four and then five, but we're super excited about scene 16 and we can't wait to get to scene 50. And so do those right now while you're excited because your excitement creates momentum. And then every time you finish a scene, like, oh, you're like, well, now I have 20 pages written. Now I have 30 pages written <laughs> and that in itself creates momentum and you get a street going. Um, uh, and then I will also just say, talking of beginnings, you're gonna get a new idea for a, another story that you think you like even better than this one, or somewhere between pages 60 and 90 of your screenplay, mm. uh, 50 to 75% through your story, whatever your story length is, suddenly you'll have an even better idea. Mm. Um, and that's that's really just your your brain trying to find a way out of the the resistance you're facing at that point in time because that's the tough part. We I think I had a whole we had a whole slide show about that earlier, right? Yep. That's the right. that's the tough part. That's the emotionally difficult part to get through. Um, and so, uh, um, actually, focusing on the ending of your story mm. instead of how exciting a new beginning could be. Focusing on the ending of your story is what pulls you through. Like find what excites you about getting to the end of it. And even if you've already written the ending because you're writing out of order, um, then still like what, what are you setting up that's going to make that payoff that much stronger for the audience? Um, mm -hmm. Get excited about the ending that has something, then that has its gravity and a momentum to pull you forward mm -hmm. instead of just like you loved your opening and now you're just kind of losing momentum and it's just, uh, you're, you're getting tired. Um, uh, I have some friends and they have a friend who is a, a TV showrunner and he used to have a rule about meeting with young writers and that was they had to have written three scripts yeah. um, because if they've written three scripts, that means they can get through that hard part of the script um, uh, because like I, I said earlier, the blank page separates writers from non-writers yeah. and then the non-writers who still have some gumption and get going um, it's here. It's it's the fifty to seventy five percent of the way through when it gets hard. This mm. is this is when most people stop, and a lot of people have a script half written mm. um, <laughs> and not a finished one. But if you can if you can do that, if you can get through that three times and finish three scripts, even if they're awful scripts, um, <laughs> you can your craft can improve. But it, that drive and and just the willingness to go through the uh, the hard part the uncomfortable part the part where you just hate yourself and you hate what you're creating and you and you hate how every day is pages are turning out if you can get through that multiple times you're you know you you have um the stamina that it takes to be a writer um which is i think you know the drive and the stamina i think is more important than the, than the craft because the craft it's just information that can be learned and can be practiced um um, and then one thing that I do that kind of helps give me momentum from story to story is I pick one thing in the story I just finished hmm. that I would like to be a little bit better at. You're like, oh, you know, like, like I, you know, I wish I had just been a little, I don't even know how I could have done it in that story, but I want to be a little bit better at this thing. Mm. Um, and then, then I start thinking about how can I be a little bit better than that in this story, in this new context. And that gets me interested. Mm. Um, as I try to solve that problem. And so that can create momentum. Um, and then finally, I would say perspective. Mm. Um, uh, Bach, when he was writing music, mm. he would very often start, the first thing you put on the page were the letters J, J, which mm. were, uh, they were Latin for Jesu Juva, which means help me Jesus. <laughs> and the, the, at the very end of the song, he would write SDG, Soli Dea Gloria, uh, to God be the glory. And what he was doing was he was reminding himself at the beginning and at the end of what he, that um, there are more important things in the world than the piece he's writing. Mm. Uh, that, that there is a context. He was mm. giving himself perspective. Mm. Um, and while your, your metaphysics may not be the same as Box and may not be the same as mine, I start all my scripts that way. I type mm. JJ at the beginning. Mm. Uh, I have both murdered the blank page by doing that. Um, <laughs> But also I'm starting with a reminder that, you know what, it, even if the story goes off the rails, even if the script doesn't work, it's okay because it's not 
life. It's not my identity. <laughs> there is more going on. It takes place in a larger context. Mm. Um, and that also helps you with momentum because part of why we get stuck, I think, is we get to this point where we feel like we have, we are proving ourselves. Like I am not successful as a human being if I don't get through this scene. Um, and um, having that sort of perspective from the beginning um, that like, oh, you know what? I Actually getting through the scene may have no effect whatsoever on my success as a human being. Um, yeah. is, uh, it just makes it so much easier to start yeah. each day. Um, yeah, that's good. Okay. So that's starting your story overall. Yeah. I um I, I like I love a lot of that stuff. I, I also think I like to approach storytelling in a slightly different way because I'm not usually um, I don't gravitate toward the feeling of something like love. So like you say, fall in love with your story. Um, I don't usually. I don't usually fall in love with a story by first feeling some sense of amazement about it or some sense of euphoria about it. Um, so one of the things I wrote down, and this is like, as you think about writing your stories, um, this is how I often have to deal with it is actually that the story is usually I'm finding meaning in it because it is coming from a place that is deeply painful. And so actually it might be even something that I hate about myself or about the way that the world works. And so for me, it's actually, that's a, that's a signal that I'm going to write about something important. If, if I have seen it occurring in my own life, if I've seen it in occurring with real humans around me, then there's this sense that I have that sits on me that says, I feel like, I need to learn to deal with this problem in my own life, in my own way. And the characters around me are sort of the people around me. And how are we going to deal with this program collectively? And it's it's not until much later that I actually start to fall in love with what I'm doing. <laughs> right. So uh, I like that. I like that concept. Um, I like that concept a lot. But for me, it's almost like a reversal of the process. Like I I can't fall in love with a thing until I have seen it as being entirely human and entirely full of pain and something that I maybe even I resent or I hate it. And then it's like, well, then how do I deal with this in a way that brings redemption um, mm -hmm. to this situation? Um, or if it's going to end in no redemption at all, if it's just going to end in depravity, why do I feel so compelled to deal with this situation or this topic? And for me, that means that um, that I have to have people around me who 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 showcase love and who showcase things that I might not be feeling as I go to begin the story, um, because I have to have people around me who are going, you know, we're here with you, despite the fact that you don't like writing about this thing and that you don't like the pain that exists in the world regarding this particular activity. When I write uh, when I wrote started writing Death of a Bounty Hunter. A lot of it was because I was feeling the lead characters was feeling this guilt and shame. And I was feeling that in my own life. And I'm going like, I'm feeling this stuff. Where do I find relief from this? Where do I get relief from this? Because if I don't get relief from this, this is a very terrifying way to continue the rest of my life. And, um, and I think that, that, that place uh, you will eventually fall in love with, the story that you're creating that finds redemption and forgiveness for that shame and guilt. But along the way, like early on, you may not feel any love at all. And so I think you have to then look even deeper into yourself to say like, well, why is this even relevant for me to pursue? Because it's going to be very difficult for you to pursue. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love the fact of falling. Cause I would say now death of a bounty hunter is a story that I've fallen in love with, but it did not start that way. And so looking at some of those ways to get there, I think is really cool too. Yeah, Jim Kruger has a fascinating way about talking about, I think, what you're talking about. Mm. Um, and, and he says, well, what is your story saying no to? Mm. Uh, what is there in the world where you, you're just like, no, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, something that, that angers you or saddens you that, that you, you want to refute? Um, mm. And that uh, that's a place that uh, he has talked about starting a story. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, I would feel very similarly to him as I start stories, mm. for sure. Yeah. Well, any, any other advice for writers as they're starting? I mean, like, obviously 
I think um, to your point and to my point there, when you're starting in these places, uh, it's really good. It's very difficult during a pandemic, but it's very good for you to have resources around you who will give you good, honest feedback, but not come down on you personally. Right. Um, so that's a that's a place to, hey, find some resources for yourself where you can, you know, is it a story group is the story group, by the way, my always my my recommendation for a story group is that they're distinctly not your audience, but they are your peers who want to support you, <laughs> uh, because those are two very different things. Um, they oftentimes will not be your audience, and they'll be like, "Why are you doing this?" And you guys have to go. I know that my audience will love this thing, so I have to go there. But can you tell me how to do it better, or can you can you tell me where you see problems in it? so that I can improve it for my audience. So you're testing against two different groups, but they're the group that's gonna love you as you do it, even if you get bad reviews from people who never should have been in your audience to begin with, right? Um, yeah. But even spiritual practices, I like to do spiritual practices, whether it's prayer, meditation, reading, reading things that I think contain wisdom that remind me to go back to, so you see a problem in the world, but what? how do you solve that problem? And then looking at other resources to see how that's, so. so yeah, this is the book of wisdom that I choose, but what is the book of wisdom that somebody else chooses to say, right? And understanding what those are from different perspectives so that I can see the full elephant and be able to describe the elephant well. So what else? What are some of the things, what are some of those things that you like to do? What are some of the things that you work into your daily life that help? Yeah. You? So, you know, once you've started it, mm. um, then it becomes about starting it again every day. Um, uh, and, and again, it becomes, it becomes momentum again. If you, if you write for one day and then you don't write for two weeks, then, then you have to start over from scratch again. You have no momentum. Yeah. Um, and it, so that's why it becomes more and more daunting to go back and sit down and start it over again. And that's why two weeks becomes three weeks and three weeks becomes four <laughs> weeks. Um, momentum. And so just writing this, this two days in a row and you have momentum. So sit down, start your story, do, some, do part of it the next day, and mm. um, boom, you have momentum. Um, mm. And so uh, I I have some some rituals and some some triggers and some techniques that I've I don't always use all of them but I have found all of these to have effect in creating that and getting me down getting that getting me started that mm. that next day so that now it's two days and now it's three days and now it's four days uh, and the momentum only picks up yeah um, so one of those is. Uh, I, you know, there's a there's a there's a quote um, by the novelist Somerset Maugham, hmm. um, where he says, "I only write when inspiration strikes. Luckily, inspiration strikes every morning at 9 a.m." <laughs> nice. <laughs> and and you know that's that's an inspirational quote. You're, but it it's not a technique quote, if that makes any sense, because he's yeah. he's he's not saying what has happened inside of him that he's able to sit down and do that every morning at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. or. But in another book that I read years after first reading that quote, I came across um, his morning ritual. It was a book mm. describing people's morning rituals. And, and when I read his morning ritual, suddenly it all made sense, his <laughs> quote about 9 o'clock. Because every morning he would eat breakfast at 8 o'clock. Mm. And then at 8.30 he would take a bath. Mm. And in the bath, in his mind, he would compose his first two sentences of the day. Mm. So that when he sat down at his desk at 9 he already knew what he was going to write for the first two sentences. And once you've written two sentences, suddenly you, you know what the third one is. You know what the fourth one is. You know what the fifth one is. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have implemented this for myself where I only ask myself to write two sentences a day. Mm. Um, I've never stopped there. Because as, <laughs> as soon as I do, I keep going. But it makes it so easy to start versus I've got to write a thousand words today. I've got to write a chapter today. I've got to write this today. Um, all I do is say, you know what? I just need to write two sentences today. Mm. And that makes it easy for me to do it day after day after day. And I always write way more than two sentences. Mm. Um, and and actually, after I write the first two sentences, I will say out loud, today was a success. Um, oh, cool. Which just sort of, it just, it, again, it helps create momentum. And I feel good because it's like, I've done it again, you know? Um, so two sentences, that's what I learned from mom. And there, and there's versions of this. Um, when I had an office that was separate from my house, I would drive to this office and I would write there. Mm -hmm. It was five minutes from here. Mm -hmm. Um, so my, my rule was all I had to do was go every day. Um, uh, if I, if I got there and if I got to the office and I was like, no, just 
don't feel like writing today. I could come home. It didn't matter. I had, I had succeeded because I had gone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had lost maybe 15 minutes of my day at the mm -hmm. most, you know? Um, and there was one day when I got there and I was like, nope, not today. And I went, <laughs> yeah. but every other time I sat down and before I knew it, an hour, two hours, three hours, I had been writing for a while, but all I asked of myself was to go. Um, and so that was sort of a version of two sentences. Um, yeah. so, so just find a very small thing to ask of yourself that you can do, that you can sustain day after day after day that, um, that does not feel like a burden so that you can start every single day. So I would say that's probably the, that's the heart of what, I, of what I'm gonna say about starting each day. Um, but there are some other ways to do this. Hemingway famously would just stop when he hit either a certain time or a certain word count, mid-sentence. Mm. Um, but stopping mid-sentence had the same effect for him that it did for Somerset Mom because he came, he had came back and all he had to do was finish the sentence that was already partially written. Right. And, then, and then so he had begun already. Once you begin, you know, it's the beginning that is the hard part. I, um, uh, I, I jokingly say that 90% of writing is sitting down and starting, you know, and it really is because, <laughs> um, so Heming, that's how Hemingway approached that same issue. Um, and then Josh Waitzkin, uh, I, I learned some stuff from too. He is the, he's the kid that the movie Searching for Bobby Fisher is about. Oh. Uh, and he wrote this book called Art of Learning, The Art of Learning. And what I love about Waitzkin is, yes, he is a chess prodigy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then when he was reached his late teens, he quit chess and he moved into Tai Chi and he became um, a world champion at Tai Chi. Um, then he quit that and he moved into Jiu Jitsu and um, and opened a school with the with the probably the greatest Jiu Jitsu um, player of our time. And then <laughs> and he excelled at Jiu Jitsu. And then he now he's doing um paddle surfing, I think it's called. Anyway, oh, so yeah. but it, it, so it turns out that what Josh's true gift is not I'm good at chess, it's I'm good at learning how to excel at anything that I approach. Yeah, um, He's good at learning. So his book, Art of Learning, is about learning how to be better at something in a, in a very concrete, tangible way. And, you know, he has a, he, con he works as a consultant and his expertise is not getting you from one to 99. It's, it's how are you out of the 10 people who are the best in the world at this? Mm -hmm. How will you go from 10th to first? Oh, wow. It's tiny, tiny incremental changes amongst people who are all amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be, I, I recommend that book all the time to people. There's a lot to be learned from him, but he has a whole chapter in there about building your triggers. Um, creating a just a trigger so that when so that you can start that song or have that scent or um read that read the thing or whatever and you're in the zone like you're basically creating a shortcut for yourself into the flow state um okay. he elaborates he's like i said he's got a whole chapter but for me some ways that i've built my trigger in the past is um i i had a certain song that i would only play um the moment I sat down to write. Nice. Um, and for, for many years, it was Moby's, um, Moby has a song, an instrumental song, God hovering over the face of the waters. Oh. For many, many years, it was that. Um, at some point, that was not having this, the same effect it used to, and so I switched, and it was glitch mobs, starve the ego, feed the soul. Um, uh, and again, instrumental, but it, like I play that and then, and my brain is like, oh, okay, it's time to write. Cause that's the, <laughs> only, that's the only time it ever hears that song. Yeah. Um, likewise, I have an incense that I only will light at the beginning of a writing session. So the only time I smell that smell, um, and I picked this up from a, a, a possibly apocryphal story that I read. I don't even remember where I read it, that, uh, Shakespeare would had a basket of rotting apples under his desk. Um, yep. and that that scent would just sort of like click him into creative mode because you, your, your, um, uh, your sense of smell affects your mind frame so much more than a lot of your other senses. So yeah. I, I created a smell that only got smelled at the beginning of a writing session. I created a, a sound that only got heard at the beginning of a writing session. Hmm. Um, and I had a little icon that I would put on the desk. So I had a visual that only was there at the beginning of a writing session. Nice. 
Um, and then I would, I have a, like a little, like a liturgy, like you said, like starting with prayer or something like that, that I would mm. say every time at the beginning. Mm. Mm. Um, and so, and eventually it gets to the point where it's like, you know what? I don't have to do all of those today. I could just pop out the icon. I can just play the song. Oh, here's the incense. Um, but it just makes it, but I spent time building those triggers, you know? Yeah. Um, so build your triggers and then ask something very small of yourself. Um, give yourself every chance to succeed uh, and to create momentum because momentum is your most important tool. Nice. I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and super, super difficult to do. I mean, the people that are the best at everything, uh, I, was I was talking to a friend about this the other day. The people who are the best at things have created processes mm -hmm. um, so that they can repeat those processes over and get similar results. So it's the it's the uh, opposite of the definition of insanity, which is what you keep doing the same thing, expecting different results, right? But you know that if you repeat this process, you will get something out of it in the long run. Mm -hmm. And um, and setting up those processes is yeah, really, really, really valuable. Uh, so that's great. And, and actually, it's really great to hear you say that too, because you, as somebody who approaches that from a muse standpoint, you're basically saying like, as a muse, I've also learned some mechanisms of the mechanic that mm -hmm. get me in a place where I can be a muse. And that's really fascinating. So I like, I like that. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts about what, what writers should think about before they start stories? Um, well, I mean, I think that that covers starting your story and then that's covers starting writing every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, but I'd say there's two other types of starts. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go into those. One is restarting your story. Um, mm -hmm. And then one, like I said, is starting the rest of your life <laughs> after, after a writing session. So restarting your story is when you go back to that opening um, and you are, going to, you are going to love that opening more than you should. Um, you are going to have stronger attachment to that opening than, than, you sh than is good for you because it was the beginning of your story and you have finished this, you've gone through this long trek. And you're right. like, that was the first step. That's where it all began. And so you love it for beginning this process that you that you just completed. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also when you knew the least about your story. So mm -hmm. it it is what usually requires the most rewriting is yeah. your is the opening of your story. Um, so some things to think about. Uh, one is going back to James Altucher, and I know he was talking about nonfiction writing, mm -hmm. but you probably started your story too early. Mm. Um, that's one of the most common things I see in the first draft opening of a script. You probably started too early. And even if you knew that rule, you probably started too early. Mm. Um, so you can probably remove some stuff and get the story going faster. Mm. Um, and then uh, and, you know, another thing, uh, Patty Chayefsky, the, the playwright and, and screen write, screen, screenwriter, um, I think he won an Academy Award. Um, he would, he had this, he would write us, start writing his play or his script. And then he's, he had, he would say, once I figured out what the theme was, once I figured out what it was really about, yeah. then I, he put, he put that on a sheet of paper. He taped it to the, to the top of his typewriter. And from that point forward, he never put anything in the story that wasn't about that. Um, mm -hmm. and, but then you have to, but that, but you figure it out halfway through, you still have to go back to the first half and you have to cut out all the things that aren't about that or <laughs> add things that are about that. Um, so I would say, you know, just know that you're going to love your story, your opening more than you should. Um, and, and you are going to read it with love goggles. Mm. And it's not the way other people are going to read it. So this is a great place to get people's feedback. And that's why I asked that question of when is the first time that you, that, that I lost you, you know? Yeah. Um, but then also no, you probably started too early. And, <laughs> and once you've gotten to the end of your first draft and you know what your story is really about, then you're gonna need to go and um, you're gonna have to tune the early parts of your script to match that. So that's, the, that's what I think of as restarting your story. Yeah, and that may be one of the, I don't know, in my opinion, one of the most important parts of writing is, is that part because yeah, it's, it's great that you can get started and, and getting started is really difficult. But if you want to make something better, uh, you really do have to kill some of the things that, you know, it's like the book Good to Great, which is a totally business book. 
but it's all about saying no to the things that are good so that you can actually be great. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just going to give you an example too of uh, what you're talking about. In both of the novels that I've published already, um, including Death of a Bounty Hunter and Time Slingers, I have actually added on to the beginning of the story because what I realized was that what I had started, where I had started with, when I realized later on in my process what the story was really about, I actually wanted to go back and and in the in the from the perspective of the reader, go, oh, I need to actually engage some of these emotional thoughts first. So in Death of a Bounty Hunter, for example, uh, I wanted I realized that my character needed to be perceived as isolated and alone. And and I and I and I started a new chapter of the story and to showcase how he might be perceived in this world of being isolated and alone. Hence why he has someone on top of him calling him racial slurs trying to kill him. Um, because I wanted you to feel that. I wanted you to feel that going in. In other words, I wanted you to get to know the character, the hero, like you said, uh, get to know the hero right away, but also know the tone right mm -hmm. away of what we were going to give you. Um, and so then that became a new opening. So I think that, yeah, it's really, really, really cool how that stuff works out. Yeah, yeah, it's it's crucial. Um, and then the final thing I would say is starting the rest of your life. Um, uh, because writing is, has no boundaries. It takes, <laughs> it, it takes place in your mind. And your mind is always working. Mm. Even when you're asleep, it's dreaming. Um, and I've gotten great story ideas or solved story problems in dreams. Um, so how do you keep from always working? That's, that's not good for any of us. And it's especially unfair to your loved ones and your family yeah. um, that you are going to travel to this other world in your mind. And then if you don't come back, that's mm -hmm. really, that's really um, unfair to them. And, mm -hmm. and I'm just, I, you know, your family and your loved ones are more important than your story. Mm. You have to strike a balance. You know what I mean? They also have to be able to give you the space in your life that you need to do this thing uh, because storytelling is, I think, a very important pursuit. Yeah. But if it comes down to my wife or the script, like my wife should win. And um, But there's these little ways that we violate that by just sort of like heading downstairs after writing and we're just kind of distracted because we're still just like a little bit there. Right. Um, so I... I also think that we should build ending triggers um, mm. and I call these return rituals, mm. but I, I have spent this time traveling and I spent, you know, I put together um, techniques to help me travel more quickly to this other world. Mm. So I need to put together techniques that will bring me back from it. Mm. Um, and so your return rituals, these are going to be a little more personal to you, depending on the time of day you're writing um, and your, the nature of your, do you have roommates or do you have a family? You know, do you have a spouse or do you live with your parents or like the all of that, um, will affect it. Mm. But just, it's just like building your trigger to start, mm. just build a trigger to come back. Mm. Um, and so that when you, when you're done for the day, play your victory song, um, or, or ha you know, have have another instance that you use for that, or um, uh, some, you know, sometimes I will, if it's been a significant writing day, I will go have a there's a there's a bakery a block from our house, oh. and I will go have a cupcake of victory, and that that's like how the day that's how the day ends. I usually do that at the end of a script, like I have finished the script, right. cupcake of victory time. But sometimes, <laughs> um, but that actually is a transition space. Where I'm like, oh, you know, that is over. Now I am in this stage where I'm just celebrating that that is over, that I did that. I'm enjoying life. I'm having a cupcake. I'm, I'm in the moment, you know. Awesome. Um, so just have return rituals mm. um, for coming back. Um, yeah. That's awesome. I have none of those things. So I need to. <laughs> well, and I think too, uh, it would be interesting to have this conversation when you think about going from the different rituals of the different hats that you put on, like if you're self-published or if you are producing your own stuff, um, it, it can, what can be really difficult is that even when you take off your writing hat, then you're faced with the producer hat. And then you're like, then you're criticizing your own stuff because now you're looking at it as a producer would look at it, not as a writer would look at it. You're trying to figure out how you're going to market it. You're trying to figure out how to get into a marketing mode that will actually sell it. I mean, 
the, it, it, it can get really, really complex really, really fast, which is why you do need to decide uh, at some point in your career. You can, This can change, but are you a writer for right now or are you a producer for right now? Can you do both right now? Like All of those things need to be kind of decided, and then you need to create rituals around each one of those things, which is pretty difficult to do, honestly. So, yeah. um, And I, I recommend that if you have multiple hats that you wear hmm. – um, that you only wire one per day. Ah, interesting. Today, I do all the producing work. Today, I do all the marketing work. Today, it's just a writing day. Mm. Don't try to do them the same day because the switching, I think, is what is where we get hung up. Um, mm, and sometimes you have to do more than one in a day. Yeah. Um, but I recommend using lunch to sort of split your day in half. So before lunch, you're only this. And mm. after lunch, you're only this. Um, just uh, you know, give yourself some time to sink into that role, yeah. <laughs> so that you're not skipping across the surface of being a writer, skipping across the surface of being a producer, skipping across the surface of being a marketer. Mm. Uh, give yourself some time to do it, um, and the e and the easiest way to do that is just uh, only do one at a time. Yeah, yeah, that's really good stuff. Uh, that, was that the fourth one? Have we covered the fourth one. Yeah, uh, return rituals was the fourth return one, rituals. and it's really just sort of an extension of of your. Um, beginning rituals yeah that's awesome well any other any other thoughts any other clothing closing thoughts as you think about starting a story um i would just say to everyone who is listening to this hmm. uh, if there's a story that you have been wanting to write hmm. um go right now and murder your blank page yeah. just put the title on it <laughs> if you want to put if you want to put 120 sheets of paper together and put the title page on top so you feel like it's already kind of a real thing in the world do that mm. if you want to put jj at the beginning or whatever just mm -hmm. go murder your blank page right now and then um only and only make yourself write two sentences tomorrow and then suddenly you'll have a two-day streak um <laughs> so that's what i would say is is uh do that yeah i totally agree in fact i did a video on this channel um called how to overcome writer's block and one of the things was you just need to just need to write. Even if you don't feel like it, even if you do not feel inspired, you just need to show up because sometimes when you show up and you start writing something really awful, you go, well, that's really awful. I have a better idea and this is what it is. And it suddenly comes to you. So um, and I think that yeah. the rituals you talked about are really critical in just getting you to the table to put stuff down. And then even if it's terrible, you're like, well, I am writing. So that's something. And then, <laughs> you might be inspired on top of the terrible. And so that's, you know, do that. That's great. Yeah. And, and that, that actually brings up another truth. I think I've talked about this before, but, hmm. um, but I think it's one of the key, it's like one of the foundation stones of a writer's life is just know that the, your emotional re relationship to what you're creating does not, is not reflected in the quality of what you're creating. Um, um, so some days you're, you will just hate, Every word will just fight you and you will just hate the day and you will feel like you got nothing done. Um, and then you'll find out later, oh, that's the scene everyone loves. So yeah. to me, that day was a failure, but in that part of the script is a success. Mm -hmm. um, and then it works the other way too, where on a day where you're just like, nailed it. Um, <laughs> then that's the first scene. Everyone's like, you got to cut that out. That's not <laughs> that belong there. You know, um, and you know, sometimes your emotions will line up with the quality of what you're creating. Yeah. But they're not a barometer. Um, you have the worst perspective on that. You have no perspective on your own writing, uh, especially in the middle of it. Um, mm. So just know that feeling bad about what you're creating right now doesn't mean it's not the best pages you've ever written. And feeling good about what you're creating right now doesn't mean it's not the part of your script that you're going to have to throw out first. So just know there isn't a correlation. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's great. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I don't have anything else to add. Uh, we've, we've gone on for an hour and a half, which is awesome. And I'll break, I'll be breaking this video up into multiple parts. So that'll be cool too. Those will come out later. Um, so Caleb is where people can find out more about you. Yep. And they can go check out the Mongolian connection. I still need to book time on my calendar so I can watch that. Um, days keep passing by without me watching it. I really want to watch it. I really want to talk to you about it on this, on this podcast too. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, that'd be really fun. Uh, so if you like this conversation, please hit that like button for us. And if you've got a comment or a question, 
leave it in the comments down below. In fact, I go back and answer questions whenever people leave questions for me. So feel free to do that. If you ask a question for Caleb specifically, because you don't really want my advice, then I'll let him know. <laughs> He'll answer it for you too. Uh, Caleb and I will be back in two weeks with another live show, two o'clock on a Friday, two weeks from today. So if there's anything that you want to know about from a storytelling perspective or a topic that you would like us to cover, please let us know. Um, and make sure you're subscribed to this channel so you don't miss that conversation. In fact, hitting the bell for notifications is helpful because when we go live, you'll be notified that we went live and you can join us right then and there. Keep writing, keep grinding, keep, keep writing, keep grinding <laughs> to you on the next video. Thanks, Caleb. Hey, oh, you're welcome. It's been great. Absolutely, man. <laughs>